Magic is found in every room where people connect over a shared purpose. In this weekly podcast, Luke, Hannah, and Chris explore the role of purpose, courage, mindset, and culture in every leader's quest for transformational performance. Hello, and welcome to Magic in the Room. I am Hannah Bradrood. And I'm Luke Freeman. And I'm Chris Robin. How are you guys doing today? Doing good. How are you? Uh, doing great. Uh, we are, boy, just uh, enjoying a nice winter's day here. Uh, nice and cool outside. It's sunny. Uh, got to enjoy a nice fire last night. Did the s'mores and the whole nine. So it's a good day. It's a beautiful, sunny winter day in Montana. So, yeah, a little bit of snow outside, a little less than usual this time of year, but uh, there's some snow and some sparkly, sparkly weather outside. That's the best word for it. Well, we're working our way through uh, you know, in, into a new year and, and new times and, and talking about the different types of order that we can create as we uh, build businesses. And I think something that has always been really central to our existence as an organization and really what has brought us together as a community, is this idea of service differentiation and some, I guess, decades old work around service profit chain. And that's, that's really going to be our topic for today. What I like about the model is that in eight to the model is the action plan. So that's probably one of my favorite things about this for, for the folks out there um, listening or maybe perhaps hearing this concept for the first time. It is a, it's a service model that was originally developed at Harvard University by James Heskett, Gary Loveman et al. Gary Loveman went on to become CEO of Harris Corporation. But really, it, when this was published like early 90s, 1994, I believe, it was really groundbreaking stuff to say that if a company can be values forward and aligned to its values, then it can increase customer engagement, loyalty, and revenue. And it's, it was just this idea that if companies got a lot more human, they could make more money than what they could ever think possible. And it just, the very first time I read it, I was like, this is it. I finally have research to what I believe organically. Like I always felt like, as long as we're nice, we make all the money. It's when we're not nice that we, we stop making the money because people don't want to engage with us. So it's this inherent idea that likability is, is so central to business success and that ultimately what we're creating are shared value systems. You know, every organization is only going to attract buyers that believe what they believe. Um, and we're going to pull some thread on that in a little bit, but let me start with our with our question of the day, and that is, I want I want to hear from you guys about maybe a time that you received just value added service, like something that was above what you were expecting, and you know share that story here, or maybe if it's not a particular time and place. Maybe you have a brand or an organization in mind that just consistently delivers on this promise of value added service. Yeah, so I have one that's pretty top of mind, and this is a, a small one, but we ordered some floating shelves, going to put up in our bathroom um, from just an online, you know, little modular furniture company. Uh, it's overseas. And uh, whenever we got the box and, and opened it up, you know, this note came out with all of the hardware and the shelving and all of that good stuff. And I kind of glanced at it and I was like, oh, well, that's kind of cute. They have this thing that they printed that looks handwritten and, you know, clearly it's too long that they, no one wrote this, you know, no one writes notes this long to put in every package. And so I kind of set it aside and, um, my wife was looking at, she was like, this is a handwritten note. And I was like, no, it can't be, you know? So I took it and I was holding it up, looking for the, the pin marks on it. And I was like, it, this is handwritten. And, you know, it was a nice little, thank you for purchasing our product. We really appreciate you. Hope it brings you joy and satisfaction. You know, it brings us joy to create this for you. And, you know, I don't remember exactly what it said, but along those lines and, 
it just like got my whole wheel spinning to say like, there's a real person, you know, on the other end of this. I didn't get this thing that was machined by robots and packaged in a big warehouse. And, and maybe it was all of those things, but there were also people involved that had some thoughts about how it was going to be used in our home. And uh, it was just, did we get the same result that we would have gotten without the note? Sure. You know, we've got some shelves that we needed to put some things on, but um, I feel differently about those shelves than I would have felt about the exact same shelves without the note. You know, I feel a human connection to the, the wood and the steel and aluminum hardware that came with it. Well, and, and what I'd say is how do you, with that level of affinity, when you're looking for another product like that or just other items that are similar, where do you buy it from next time? Yeah, exactly. I mean, it, you go back and say, man, someone wrote me a note from there. Like I want to give them my business. Like I have some sort of connection to that person. Why would I not support that person? Because we clearly have some shared beliefs about why this shelf is important for my home. That's exactly right. And um, I think that's the whole idea of value added service. It starts to take price out of the equation. So, you know, we're not shopping in that scenario. Next time you need shelves or a like product, you're not going to care so much about a 5% price difference. You know, it is really about, you know, I like this company. They care about their people and, and, they, and those people care about me. And, and that's, uh, that's the whole idea of value added service. It's something above and beyond the utility of the commodity you're purchasing and creating like that human connection. Uh, between ourselves and the brands that we put. Anna, where are, you, where are you at? Yeah, that kind of, that's a good jumping off point, that whole point of, um, you know, we care about companies that we feel care about us, right? And so when employees show that they care about their customers, we feel like the company cares. And you know, what we often say when we work with clients is that how employees are treated internally is how they'll treat their the customers, right? So how, how we treat our people in our organization is how our people will treat our customers. And so the, you know, one, one example that stands out, you know, I was traveling, I'm at a gate, this was back when we were flying a lot more <laughs> when, when I lived in Oklahoma and I'm at the gate and I see the ground crew dancing at the gate and I get on the plane and this is on another flight. I'm on the plane and the flight attendant is singing to the entire plane and it was a dang good singer. These are two examples of just flights with um, with Southwest Airlines. And, and I think I've mentioned them before because they're such a great example of, you know, a company that is really from the ground been focused on putting employees first, not customer first. They put employees first, but in turn, employees put customers first, right? And so by really focusing on the internal service quality the internal culture, having fun at work and encouraging uh, employees to have fun, to express themselves, to feel like they're being taken care of. In turn, that is ex the experience that we have as customers. And now I have to admit, I haven't flown Southwest for a few years because where I live in Montana today, they don't service that area, right? And so I don't, um, I don't get to fly Southwest. So I, I don't have recent experiences, but that has been consistently the experience that, you know, yes, they started, they do have lower pricing because they offer bare minimum of service, right? And when they first started, they had just very specific routes that they flew. But the quality of the experience that you had when you flew with them because of that human connection is what, you know, really help to build that company into what it is today. Yeah. It's a great example of like all, 
all planes have the same utility, they get to point A to point B. Right? So how do we differentiate that experience? And if it's not through you know, Woodford Reserve and cloth linen and, and a, a high-end meal, then what is it? What about for the other 95% of the people out there? Um, and they've just done a really nice job of differentiation through value added service. And I think that's a great example of a company that starts internally, right? The why is the heart on the other side of the plane? You look at how much effort, like their onboarding videos, I know we've all seen those, and just how much intentionality and effort goes into the creation of that culture. I think that goes all the way back to Gary Kelly and, and just knew what type of company and the values that he wanted that to have. And to operationalize those values, then attract everyone that believes like they do. I think that's that's the that's a great example of value added service. Um, you know, I also think it now's a good time to call out that when Heskett, Loveman et al, when they built this model, it started with internal service quality. It basically said what we take, the sentiment we take to the world is what's going to be returned to us. So if we take love, care, and respect to the market, our company will be loved, cared, and respected. If we take profiteering, extraction, um, value, all those things, and we focus only on those things, efficiency, and we only go after that, then what do you think will be returned to us? Like you're going to be squeezed into a low price competitor strategy or, or a specific position that isn't very nimble. So call out being when this model was first built, it started with internal service quality, basically building our uh, employee life cycle in a way that's aligned with our values. Um, we've ex we as Purpose and Performance Group have expanded on that model, you know, since that time. Um, but ultimately, it's it's always about alignment. So we'll get to that in just a moment. Um, you know, my story is probably I'll share Costco. You know, that that's something that when we were all in strategies class and and we dove into. Costco, I thought that was a super interesting experience. At that time, we didn't have Costco in Tulsa, so it was all in theory to me. But now, you know, I'm a, I'm a Costco uh, shopper and a Costco buyer. And, and, you know, one element of service from a company to its consumers is product availability. And I think about Costco, the first thing that I think about and why I shop there is the element of discovery. And this curated product discovery that in this experience that I get to have when I shop at Costco, just by nature that there's a discovery component makes it more interactive. It's not a product price play. It's not, well, I'm going to shop at Target because it's closer. I mean, for me, Walmart is the closest Target and Costco are across the street from one another but I will choose Costco because of the interactive experience of discovering new product. The also the thing that some people do not like, but I, I think is very on brand is when I find something I like at Costco, I don't know how long they're going to carry it. It could be six weeks. It could be six months. I don't know. But today I really like this skirt steak and tzatziki sauce and three weeks from now, I may never find it again. So it's, it, it drives, it nudges a behavior from me when they have it, buy it, because I may not see it next time I'm there. And I think that's really part of their strategy. And they believe that the shopping experience should be interactive uh, and have a sense of discovery to it and engage people that way. And then they align their entire system to accomplish that the corporate buying process all the way to the floor level uh, at our local stores. So and that's me kind of sharing my experience and, and that's value added service to me from a company that regularly de delivers on that commitment. Um, so let's, let's go back to the model for a moment and mm -hmm. think about just differences in how the model was originally built to what it looks like today. Um, the model originally built said, if we deliver really good internal service, then we're going to get satisfied employees. Well, then we started pulling thread on that and said, you know what? I can put M&Ms in the break room. 
that will satisfy employees, but it will not engage employees. So how you know, the question that we then asked was, how do we deliver internal service in such a way that it engages employees? Because what we need, we don't need satisfied team members, we need engaged team members because the engaged ones deliver value added service and do their jobs really well and they don't get hurt and there's all these other benefits. But when we started pulling thread on that, you know, we found kind of these four primary things that every organization has to do. And I mean, these are the things we have to action and these are the things that ultimately show up. So when we say having high degrees of internal service, we effectively have four things that every company has to do in order to engage their employees. So let's pull some thread on that. And, um, you know, this very first thing is value congruence and the idea that everyone operating within this system and the operating protocols of the system have to be congruent with one another. And why is that true? I think that would be my question. Why do those things have to be aligned? I mean, I think the answer to that's, it's complex, but it's simple. You know, if we're looking for someone to really pour their heart and their effort into something, they're only going to do that for something that they truly believe in, or it's just going to be transactional, right? You, you pay me X dollars and I'll give you X hours of labor and I'll check some things off the list, right? For people really to give their heart to something, they need to know that you believe what they believe and that the work that they're doing advances their own beliefs uh, and their own purpose and values in the world. Yeah, I think that's, um, that's spot on Luke. And I, I would just add, I mean, that's, we, you know, we show up for, for the things and the people that we really care about and, we will do the bare minimum when our paycheck relies on it. Uh, if if we think we might get fired, if we think that there's a, you know, like if, if we're trying to survive, we'll do what we need to do, right? But for us to go that, you know, put that extra discretionary effort in, we have to feel some sense of ownership, right? That's the difference between owning a home and renting a home. You put a lot more effort into maintaining and upkeeping a home that you own, right? So when we have psychological ownership of our our world and our and our work and we feel like this is part, you know, part of my identity is somehow aligned with what is happening in this organization, I will treat my work as if I own it rather than just being paid to do a job. And I think that's where we see those big outcomes, you know, differences in outcomes from, you know, and, and, and I titled this episode purpose, profit and the role of service, because, you know, having that shared purpose and the shared values that we can all agree to commit to, is what is going to lead to those outcomes that you mentioned earlier, Chris, about increased prof profits. But there has to be alignment every step of the way. This is called the service profit chain because there's a chain of events that lead to the outcome of profit. So if we lead with profit, we're, we're missing a really big, crucial part of the picture. Yeah, and, and I think that antecedent to engagement of like we've got to clear that hurdle of value congruence. And that's why we grew the service profit chain to put a lens of purpose before we even get to internal service quality, knowing that we have to be value congruent throughout the system. It makes sense to look at our the purpose of our enterprise, like what is our brand purpose, organizational purpose, why do we exist? Now let's carry that into how we do everything in the employee life cycle. So, you know, that was our, I guess, our main contribution to the service profit chain is looking at everything through the lens of purpose, because here's the challenge traditionally. 
Um, I know what I believe good work is. I know what I believe good outcomes are. You tell me you're advertising for a job role. I take the job. You say you're going to pay me to do the job. And then I carry with me what I believe good outcomes are into that job role because you've never explained to me what you believe good outcomes are. And I have to experience that over some longitudinal existence. And it's revealed to me what you believe by behavior, very piecemeal. And I, in you know, my third week here, here's something I experienced that discounted what I believed about the organization to be true. On my sixth week, I experienced something else. And during my 90-day review, I, I had this realization. And I started to, you know, experience ways that continue to discount the value of this brand in my eyes. And now, a year from now, I've just wasted a year here. I don't believe in the value of the brand. And it's because it was revealed to me over time. No one said, this is what we believe. This is what it means to be an employee here. If you want to contribute, here are the expectations and the commitments we need from you. Like, are you in or are you out? Like, too many times, this is all left up to chance. And that's why we put before we start talking about how we shape the employee life cycle, let's get clear about the purpose, values, and commitments required of the team members. Put that in the brochure and get everyone saying, yes, I sign up for that. And then if we can really align the system, um, it gets really powerful because it spins up on itself from day one with the team member supporting the organizational beliefs and the organization supporting the team member beliefs. And that's where a really healthy internal culture comes from. You get highly engaged employees, but you don't get there without being explicit about why this organization exists and what is required from the team members to make it all work. So that's, I just wanted to call that out is, you know, the old, the old chain started with internal service or that, how you do a uh, team member life cycle. What we've expanded the research to is to say the, the purpose of the organization is required to be authentic and explicit before that's designed in order to activate. Yeah. So perhaps it might be helpful for the listeners if we just kind of walk through step by step what the steps in the model are or what the links in the chain, if you will, are. Um, and we'll make sure we put a, a link in our notes too, so you can download um, a document that shows this model and, and how it's applied in organizations. But it really starts with, you know, as, as Chris outlined, that shared purpose for the organization. So identifying what is the purpose, the overarching purpose of the organization. And then the next step, internal service quality with four important antecedents of value congruence, organizational support, organizational participation, and fairness. Um, so when you have all of those things, there is a perception of high quality service internally that leads to higher employee engagement. And we all know that when employees are engaged, they perform better, right? So that leads to those types of value added services that we've been talking about. Uh, when we have value added service, we get higher client satisfaction with higher or customer satisfaction, right? And with higher satisfaction for our customers, we get their loyalty. So when we have loyalty, that leads to revenue growth. When, when people keep coming back again and again, just like in those examples we, we mentioned early on. Yeah. And that's, you know, I think a really good example on buying behavior, Hannah, is like how many times I go to Target versus how many times I go to Costco. Like Costco is more bulk based, right? So let's just say for every ten times I go to Target, I go to tar I go to Costco twice. Okay, so ten to two um, for Costco, and and this is why turnaround work is such a passion for me. Like for Costco, if I go from two trips to three trips. Okay, I take one of my target trips and I now give it to Costco. With a 10% change in my behavior, Costco has now received a 33% revenue gain. So 
when you're trying to challenge and capture additional share, like really taking a look at how much behavior change are you asking for? And then what revenue change does that yield your organization? And understand like Costco is not trying to take every trip. They want the one, they want the next trip. And that, so that's something I'm always talking about in when we're turning around service-based environments is oh, how do we focus on getting the next trip? Because the next trip, this person is already making 10 trips or 20 trips or whatever that case may be. I'm looking to influence one, preferably the next one. Just like Luke's shelf experience, right? They're trying to influence his next buying decision. He's already made that one. And in, in, in this world, we have to design to exceed. We cannot design to meet because if I just meet Luke's expectation, next time he needs shelves or modular furniture or something of that ilk, he's going to go shopping again. Well, he already found me. I, I, he's given me the golden opportunity. Luke is saying, I'm willing to buy furniture from you. And if you connect with me the right way, I'll buy furniture from you forever. Like what a golden opportunity. And that's where that mindset comes in. Do we have a meets mindset or an exceeds mindset? But the only people that can deliver on exceeds are engaged team members. So there's the rub. Yeah. I, so just to kind of bring it home, I mean, I'm gaming this out a little bit. I'm going to add another layer of personal experience onto it. So, you know, I have three sons and then my partner and I, so there's five of us, five mouths to feed in our family. That's, you know, you could probably calculate how many calories that is in a given month that needs to be intaken in our house. And so that's typically split between a few different sources. And um, one thing that we've tried a couple times, and it's been kind of a try and a miss both times, is to go with like a local farmer that does delivery service where, you know, it's a co-op of farmers and they'll bring stuff and every week they have kind of a different assortment and they put it on your front step and ring the doorbell or whatever. And, and that's a way to get some of your produce and eggs and meat and things like that. But what we found both of the times that we've tried it is that the product was just so-so and it, not about the individual product. It was all about the product mix and then the product delivery and our experience with it. So we perceived that like the packaging was very wasteful and we also perceived that they didn't know really what we wanted. And we would have taken twice as many eggs, you know, and half as many turnips or whatever than, than what was delivered to us. And so we've canceled, you know, a couple different times, but we were ready for them to say, Hey, you know, the, the Freeman family, they need X thousand calories a month. Like we were ready to give them some of those calories, but they whiffed it both times. And I'm thinking like, if you're the person running that organization, the reason that you need value congruence on your team, the reason that you need a shared purpose is so that someone somewhere will go that extra step to either capture what our family in particular needs or to think about, well, this house is only three miles from our, you know, the location where we package everything up, which was the case with one of these that we tried. Do I need to use the amount of packaging for that house that I need for everywhere else? So are there operational reasons that maybe those things were impossible? Sure. But I think it's a great example of, you know, presentation on the porch. Right. Those things matter. Those are that value added service pieces that I think we oftentimes miss when everything is just shotgun approach to how we deliver things. And, and there's not that human element in it where people can really make those that last mile customization in the delivery of the product. And the, that last mile customization is everything. And, and that's what makes it a fully vetted model. You know, so many times we have like under vetted business models where, you know, this scenario is this co-op has, uh, you know, just food overage or extraneous items to, uh, you know, distribute, sell, et cetera. And they're like, look, we have all this resource, like let's, let's make a business out of it. 
but there's so much more to it than having the right platform or having the right product. And the, the takeaway I'd say, you, when we can ask ourselves as service organization, is assuming that other businesses sell similar things, I can get produce somewhere else. I can, you know, if it's lodging, I can stay at a hundred different places within any given city. It's about, can I get the right product to the right person at exactly the right time at the price they need it at the way they want it? So walk through that cascade and figure out like where are you doing well as an organization and where are we falling down? And, you know, I was in a conversation last week and, you know, I said, well, when we're receiving, when we're receiving product for uh, quality, what's our hit rate? Like, okay, 90, 95%. Well, when we're receiving product that we have on order for quantity, what's our hit rate? Like 90, 95%. Well, is that, is that where we want to be? Like, I don't control that decision. Maybe 90% is exceedingly high for the industry. Maybe 95% is world class. I don't know. But do we want to go out there and say, hey, buy with us. We're right 95% of the time. And like to be service differentiated, I think it has to look a little different, right? Like we got to pick out the thing where we are 100%. We need the message around that. Like what are our strengths? And I think that's, that's really the idea is to, to find those spots where we really are 100 percent and leverage those and engage and rally our employees around those ideas. So Anna, thoughts around uh, you know, purpose and value congruence, all that? Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's the central core theme in, in everything that, you know, our, our organization is, is centered around purpose. We are called Purpose and Performance Group for a reason because we believe that purpose elevates performance. And so, you know, back to kind of our, our discussion earlier, when we feel like we're part of something greater, when we feel like we're part of something that we, um, you know, that our personal values are aligned with, um, you know, that's that's when we can connect in a different way to an organization. And we had some discussion earlier before we, you know, recorded this episode about, you know, what happens when you squeeze everything out of a system for the sake of efficiency, right? So when profitability becomes the main focus and you're looking to create efficiencies at every turn, and I'm not saying we shouldn't look for efficiency, but efficiency isn't everything because when you squeeze it too tight the system and your entire focus is on extracting profit you lose the margin and you lose that opportunity to you know develop and align to purpose values um, and create that congruence throughout the entire chain yeah it's really hard to say you're going to run an extraction model and a development model, you know, it, and it, it's this idea of maximized versus optimized, I think is, is the dialogue and how do you get the right amount of margin for innovation and creativity? And I think there's such a cop out on, well, we've got to bring innovation and creativity to this organization. Well, only because you squeezed it all out. <laughs> right and you squeezed it out in the name of short-term profit and maximizing returns to shareholders like it was there but you squeezed it out and now like i'll call it the mba cycle that we went through like so the mba squeeze out the efficiency and now we've got to layer back in creativity and innovation as an inefficient as an inefficient standalone because we already did these other harmful things in non-developmental uh, business execution. Right. And here's the creativity innovation secret is like, it's not gone. You've just programmed that behavior out of people. Like it, that's why we say we believe in the latent potential of every individual. Like I believe that everyone's innovative to some degree and everyone's creative. But if, if you've created a system that they show up in every day 
that de incentivizes creativity and innovation and and has over prioritized other items, well, yeah, of course you're not going to be innovative as a company. Well, and guess where all that creative energy is going to go, though? Because we all have it, and it's going to go to trying to figure out how to get around the rules or how to, you know, come up with, um, you know, new ways of, you know, subverting the system in a way. Or it might just mean that people start working on their own pet projects and that's where all their creative energy goes and and then you know you don't get it <laughs> we don't get it in in our organization right and that's where you know some companies make that a, a policy like google is is well known right they allocate a certain amount of your time you should spend on just whatever your pet project is <laughs> but then we get to use those ideas right when they when they become developed yeah and i mean to flip it on its head this is this is where organizational psychology sometimes feels a little manipulative but you know another place that people use their creativity is like volunteering with their kids girl scouts group or the, the group at church that they do stuff with or whatever it is, you know, they, that they need to get life from and they need to have an outlet for their ideas and what they want to contribute to the world. And I nothing bad about all of those outlets, but there's no reason an organization shouldn't capture a lot of that energy. Right. I mean, if you if you've got someone that shows up every day and does the same thing all day, every day, and maybe they're even a, a great worker, but you know that they're going and pouring all this passion and energy into something outside the walls of the company. Like, again, this isn't a black and white thing that I'm saying. Sometimes that could be really positive. But I think a lot of the times it's because you've probably failed and you haven't given them any opportunity to find something that they can really bring what they believe to in the organization. And, and I'll say like, if your purpose, whether it's stated or not, is profitability or efficiency, like there's a very small group of people that that's gonna be the thing that they get really passionate about. Yeah, I remember I was uh, doing a job search one time and the website, like the recruitment uh, was anchored to, you're really gonna like your paycheck. And that's what it said. And I'm like, well, I like places where I'd like my paycheck. Like, who doesn't want to like their paycheck? I'll, I'll go in and see what this is all about. And I'm waiting for, I, you know, big ivory tower situation. I'm waiting for the person to come down to my interview. And the admin is sent to retrieve me. And I just remember sitting there watching everyone walk for their morning coffee with their heads down, doing like the zombie mocha walk. Um, and finally the admin shows up and I'm like, hello, how are you today? And like, she sticks her tongue out at me and, and does the <laughs> sound, you know? And I'm just like, this, I can't work here. Like now I'm just wasting my time going through this interview process because they've said, I'm really going to like my paycheck, but this person, like, her day is miserable. And judging by the body language of everyone zombie walking to the coffee shop, <laughs> they all look pretty miserable too. So like I haven't even started the interview yet and I am out. So it's that whole, there's not many people that will align with profit and profit only. Um, and if so, it's that short run, I'll do it for three years, make enough to retire, have stock options. And it's okay. Like if you know that's the extraction model that you're running, um, but kind of moving on with the service profit chain and, and just take a couple moments here, it like gets really all anchored the value congruence. That is the first antecedent to get people engaged. It's why we have to be clear and authentic about our purpose as an organization. And then once we get that value congruence, it kind of tips. It goes, you know, it, when people are in that community of shared belief, um, they engage, they deliver the value added service which makes mavens and ambassadors out of the customers. The customers are more loyal. And then we get that revenue growth because of that disparity between behavior change and profitability that we talked through earlier. But I really just want to touch on those other antecedents and some of the methods that we use uh, to get those things specific around 
specifically around organizational participation and organizational support. When I think about those things, I think about the organizational support as all of those people processes, how we recruit, how we onboard, how we do performance management, our recognition program. Like I think that as organizational support and then the organizational participation, I think has everything to do with communications modeling and 360 degree feedback. And you said we did and all hands and check-ins and coaching culture. And anyway, I know that's a lot. But when you think about those other antecedents, what are some kind of critical tipping points that make this chain work or activate? All of these antecedents, value congruence, organizational support, organizational participation, and fairness, yes, 100% agree. There's a lot of uh, executive leader work in clarifying them. There's a lot of people processes, communications processes. But the effectiveness of all of that work that you put in and all of those processes that are built is mediated by the managers and supervisors in the organization. So if they're on board with all of these items, absolutely yes. Like there's gonna be a tipping point. Uh, engagement is gonna go up. Eventually loyalty and revenue is gonna rise as well, all right? If you have folks who don't buy in, and they, they are really attached to the old models, whether they're consciously attached to them or unconsciously, that's just how they work and how they've known to work for a long time. You can do all of that work and see very little output. Yeah, that's a, that's a really great point. And that's where, you know, the, the organizational participation piece, you know, seeing we do what we see. So when we see our leaders participate in the things that we say that we value, we believe that that is actually a value and we believe that that's what's important. When we see our leaders say one thing that this is important and you should attend training and then the leaders don't attend or they multitask or they are, their attention is clearly elsewhere. The, what we see is what we believe and what we see is what we will do um, as, as a result, right? So it has to, it has to start from within and it has to be lived and it has to be lived openly and demonstrated by the leaders and the and the supervisors at, at every layer in the organization. Yeah. And, and outside of that, you know, I look at this whole thing as it, it fuels or it gives structure to the process of alignment. You know, if we understand what internal services are, like those life cycle, those team member life cycle things and those people processes, and we put that lens of purpose values um, on that, um, it really gives us an action plan. If we say that we value people that don't have a very strong recognition program or don't make room to recognize people or don't celebrate our champions, then it is, it's confusing to the team members. Like we say we value it, like, but we don't do it. So are those just words on the wall? And now I don't know which words to pay attention to and which words not to, because some of the words we do and some of the words we don't, and I'm just really confused. So I guess I'll have to experience it myself and make my own determination. And that's all the work we do is about aligning every people process and every operational process to what we believe. And the clearer we can get about what we believe the more likely is we're going to tip this service profit chain. Um, and kind of with that, I want to open it up to you guys and like how, how should we think about service profit chain? How does it continue to play out in our day to day? And, uh, you know, how do people engage with us in order to talk about it more? Yeah. So I do want to tell a, a little bit of a story because this happened just the other day. Um, so I was in a meeting and we were talking about rolling out, a uh, basically an employee experience um, focused people practice, right? Giving some people a little bit more autonomy in the organization. And we we're talking about this is a global company that we consult with. And um, 
they started talking about, well, how does this apply internationally? How does this apply in some of our smaller offices that are away from the state of our home office? And someone from finance spoke up and said, well, you know, when you get to those smaller offices, uh, there's just not that many people there. And he was thinking about, you know, what this meant operationally, right? So there's there's only five or 10 people in each of those little offices. Like, I don't think he said these words, I don't think the juice is worth the squeeze to roll out this employee engagement focused people process to those people. And so it didn't really sit right with me. And I was thinking, oh, why, why does that feel so wrong? And eventually I just had to say, well, there's still people there, right? I mean, <laughs> there's people there that are doing work for this organization. And, and if we're willing to change how 80% of the organization experiences their connection with the company, why would we not, why would we not do the work? It's like saying it's not worth our effort as a leadership team or as a project team to actually do that last 20% because I don't see the dollars immediately. And I could go into the finances of it, right? We know that this is a professional organization. So we know that for professional positions that they're going to be costing, you know, 30 to 60 to 70% of a person's annual salary in every instance of turnover. So the ROI financially is there, but just take that off the table. Is it really doing the right thing to say, well, the ROI is less clear in this case, even though it's still the right thing to do for that person's experience of our, our values as an organization. And I don't know, that's, that's the work that we do. I think a lot of the times is pulling those threads together and helping people understand like, yes, there's ROI in changing the employee experience and, and helping them really feel and perceive that internal service quality in reaching those higher levels of employee engagement. Yes, it's there. And it's really hard to get that ROI and see it if you don't actually have a clear narrative around it and understand the service profit chain model um, from beginning to end. And, and that's a lot of what we do is walk people through it, help explain it, help draw the lines of causality between, yeah, this is why we would do this thing. This is why this would be our next project on our HR roadmap, you know, items like that. Yeah, I think for me, I just keep going back to, you know, the whole, you know, even for me, the personal experience of doing this kind of work because it's so focused on purpose, right? So every day when I get to work with organizations to really connect, you know, help organizations to connect with their overall purpose to help individuals discover their personal purpose and aligning that with the purpose of the organization, for me, I get to feel like I'm living my purpose, right? And, and even we see that in our organization, which is very much, you know, a collection of highly talented individuals that could be doing other things on their own. And, and some of us are, yet we choose to make this our primary focus and focus together on this kind of work. Uh, not because we have to, but because we want to. And, you know, we, we pull the extra hours and, and the long nights and, you know, we do the things not because it feels like work, but because it feels meaningful. And so at the end of the day, you know, that's what I'm in it for. And that's where I see the turnaround in our client organizations when we're able to help them make that transition. Yeah, and that's powerful. I think we, we kind of covered today, we definitely exposed this, our secret sauce, right? Between the revenue piece and, and why that matters and then how we get there. But ultimately we're trying to create really engaged team members, like mavens for our brands that then like energize mavens and ambassadors for our brands from the buyer side or consumer side um, and ultimately build a thriving community of leadership and team members and consumers that then like accomplish something meaningful. Whether that's putting roofs over people's heads or, um, you know, contributing in significant ways to the local communities, whatever. But that's ultimately how we get there and, and how the ecosystem works. 
Um, thank you guys for, for engaging in the conversation, for all your contributions to you know, this line of leadership that's taken all of us to, to vet out and contribute to add to and iterate and also build uh, really innov innovative ways to educate around. So anyone listening today, you guys want to connect over this, hit any of us up on LinkedIn or any of our social channels, send us an email. Um, we'd love to talk, talk with you more about it. Uh, it is a real thing. Unfortunately, it's also hard work. Um, you know, if, if anyone's looking to get this fully implemented, somebody says, well, how long till I get results? I'm like, well, you'll see results within, you know, 60 or 90 days, but it takes nine months, 18 months to get it fully on top of the water, depending on where you start and depending on what is your level of intention you ultimately want to reach. So that's different for every organization. But I will say it has to be cultivated like a mindset because what we're doing is cultivating that shared belief system, energizing mindset around how we go out our, go about our business each day. And you know we get to learn new things along the way. So thank you all for uh, being such a significant part of my journey and the journey of our client partners. And until next time on Magic in the Room, see you guys later.